Hey, Clinton, do me a favor. Can you stand on the podium for a second? Okay. <laughs> kind of but I was what's like, what's your oh, name? Clinton. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> no, it close to my <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. It's like, hey, you stand at the point. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll go. Test one, two. Test one, two. Test one, two. That's fine, Clinton. Okay. I've left my iPad. I've kind of got two. I've got my talk here, which I may use this or even here as a backup. So Perfect. That's that's me. Great. And just coming up the works here. Just Perfect. Yeah, it's enough.
lab coat ceremony for PhD students. This is our uh, sixth ceremony, recognizing the incredible journeys that our doctoral students in biomedical sciences, in neuroscience, and clinical research are embarking on. The ceremony holds significant importance and as it marks the beginning of the student's journey in academic research and training. The lab coat presented to the students symbolize the professionalism and authority that the trainees develop and nurture during their time here. Our PhD program in biomedical sciences, the program in neuroscience and the program in clinical research provide rigorous collaborative training that prepares our students to spearhead the next generation of scientific and medical breakthroughs. Biomedical and clinical research are imperative in helping us solve problem, complex, complex problems and find solutions grounded in data and the rigorous statistical analysis. We are branching out into new realms of research that leverage artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies in medicine to improve both the patient's health and quality of life. Our students are crucial part for this growth and provide diversity of thought and experience to propel us into new directions in both clinical and translational research. We are excited to have so many people joining us today, both in person and virtually, to celebrate our incoming doctoral students across our programs and to mark the start of their academic research training. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Nessler, Dean for Academic Affairs and Chief Scientific Officer, Director of Friedman Bering Institute, Nash Family Professor of the Fischberg uh, Department of Neuroscience. Dr. Nessler, please come forward. Thank you, Dr. Filizola. It is a great honor to welcome our first year PhD students our third year MD PhD students and PhD students in clinical research to this lab coat ceremony. And it's great to see so many family and friends here as well. Uh, this includes PhD and MD PhD students in biomedical sciences and neuroscience, as well as PhD students in clinical research. We remain one of the very few institutions around the country that have a lab coat ceremony, but we do so because of the ever increasing scrutiny that is being placed on the nation's biomedical research enterprise and the unique responsibility that each of you will take on as you complete your training. As you launch your graduate school studies and choose a lab for your PhD, we want you to aim high. Imagine a body of original research that will have an important impact on your field of interest. Don't settle on a project because it's easy or doable. Instead, take a chance by studying something that in its own small way will change the world. Over the years, I've given a lot of thought to what constitutes the essential ingredients in such an undertaking. First is novelty. Albert Einstein once said, if you do what you always did, you will get what you always got. This sounds trivial, but anytime I go to a scientific meeting and I walk the halls of abstracts, hundreds, sometimes thousands of abstracts, I'm always struck that a very large percentage, maybe a majority of the work falls into this category. Research that represents more obvious follow-up of earlier findings without significantly advancing the field. A second criterion is the importance or relevance of the research. All because something is new doesn't mean that it's useful. Design your studies so that they will usefully inform our understanding of a biological system under normal or pathological conditions. Be bold, ask hard questions because even being partially successful will represent a significant step forward in biomedical sciences. Third is technical innovation. The pace of progress in biological and health sciences continues to accelerate. What I did for my PhD thesis several decades ago simply would not pass muster in today's world, which offers far more penetrating methods and the ability to establish causal mechanisms in vivo. This simply was not possible when I was in training. 
These advances, however, bring with them far greater expectations for you all. The last several decades of research have answered many important questions in biomedicine, obviously, but fear not. There are many, many overwhelmingly important questions that continue to dominate all fields. For example, what triggers a cancer cell to metastasize? What makes one individual vulnerable to a virus and another not? How does the brain store memories and how do we recall those memories among, uh, upon demand? The fact that these questions remain indicates that still more powerful techniques must be developed. Take the time and the chance to build upon existing methodologies. Doing so will greatly expand what you can achieve in your dissertation research. Fourth is creativity. Advances often come about when a scientist bridges multiple fields. Read the literature broadly. Enjoy the core courses that you're taking now and elective classes. Explore the possibility of joint mentorship by faculty with different scientific backgrounds and learn as much as you can about biological systems across diverse fields. Bringing insight from one field to inform another is oftentimes how a new appreciation of a biological system is achieved. Fifth is collaboration. When I was in training, most labs worked in strict isolation from others. There was more than a bit of paranoia in not wanting to share new experimental findings, even with colleagues down the hall, let alone at other institutions. There was likewise less of a need for collaborations. And I'll just give you one example. When a reviewer of a manuscript of mine asked us to use a different technique than uh, for my PhD uh, study, we were able to tell the editor that, well, we don't have that technique available in the lab, and we got away with it. Uh, that simply won't fly in today's world, where the expectation is to deploy the broadest range of impressive experimental approaches that are currently available. This makes collaboration essential. People who are not collaborative in general do less impactful science because it is simply impossible to be an expert in all techniques. Share your findings, explore ways to build upon them with additional methodologies with the help of colleagues, and thereby dramatically expand the quality of your studies and their influence on the field. Sixth is perseverance. If a question was easy to answer, it would have been answered already. Getting a PhD is difficult. Unlike so many other graduate or professional degrees for which in a certain sense, one must merely go to class, write papers and take exams and get passing grades. Getting a PhD is fundamentally more difficult. It requires creating a new body of knowledge, information and insight that's new for the world. That's why getting a PhD typically takes five years. It's a year longer than most of you were in college. You have the time during that course to ponder, experiment, try different things, and be patient. It's okay to get negative data. We all do. Your PhD research will crescendo over time, gradually and progressively yielding more and more exciting data. Most of the data in the student's PhD thesis are obtained in the last year or 18 months of study. Keep that in mind as you get your research underway over the next few months. The final crucial ingredients are having an available and generous PI and having other members of your lab who can also help with brainstorming, troubleshooting, and collaborative experiments. They should support your goals of thinking big, having big expectations for yourself, and publishing your findings as high impact papers in respected peer reviewed journals. I think back on my time in graduate school with tremendous fondness and satisfaction, probably because I forgot all the months of negative data that I had to per persevere. I'm very proud in the end of the research that I did as a PhD student. My PI became a lifelong mentor and friend, a source of enormous support long after I graduated. And we hope that for all of you uh, in finding your PI. 
But at the same time, in, in retrospect, the few years that I spent in the lab as a graduate student represented really just the first step in a very long career. It was literally a stepping stone for what came next. For me, that was a career in academia. Many of you will take the same path while many others will use your PhDs in very different but very exciting ways, perhaps in policy, industry, publishing, to name a few. I've had a lab now for 36 years, hard to imagine. I have always considered myself one of the luckiest guys alive because every day I love going to the lab where I get to mentor young people like yourselves and pursue science, my life's passion. I hope that each and every one of you use your PhDs for an equally rewarding and enjoyable career. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nessler. I would like to recognize and thank our alumni supporters who contributed to making this uh, very special ceremony possible. Our deep appreciation also goes to the Mount Sinai Alumni Association for sponsoring the lab quotes our students are about to receive. I invite Dr. Alexis Colvin, Associate Dean for uh, Alumni Affairs, to join us on stage. Dr. Colvin. Good afternoon and congratulations on not just starting graduate school, but also joining a family of incredible alumni. I hope as you navigate your time here, you take advantage of all of the opportunities to learn from our community. There are opportunities to meet a future mentor through our Alumni Connect Mentorship Program, which pairs alums with current graduate students. There are also virtual Alumni Connect small group meetings in which you can meet with a diverse range of alums to discuss career paths and benefit from the wisdom of their experience. These sessions are truly invaluable. Before I close, I just want to say how honored I am to be able to welcome you at the beginning of your Icon School of Medicine journey, and to let you know that I will also be here at the end to welcome you into our alumni community. Congratulations again and best of luck. Thank you to uh, our alumni com community as well as Dr. Colvin. And I would like to invite now Dr. Bruce Galp, Professor of Pediatrics and Genetics uh, and Genomic Sciences, as well as the Director and Google Family Professor of the Lindich Child Health and Development Institute at the Icon School of Medicine, Mount Sinai. Dr. Galp. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't been here long enough, apparently. <laughs> Maybe in the next 30 years, they'll come up with one for me. Okay, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Bryn Levy as the keynote speaker for this year's lab coat ceremony. In a perfect world, I would not needing, be needing to do this. Bryn and I shared a brilliant and wonderfully caring mentor, Kurt Hirschhorn, who passed away last November, but would have been the right one for this task. I hope that Kurt is felling from heaven, even though he never believed in that as possible. Bryn Levy, as his accent will make clear, was born and raised in South Africa. After completing an undergraduate degree in Johannesburg and then becoming the first person to graduate a master's degree program in genetic counseling in South Africa, Bryn came to Mount Sinai in 1990, where he first studied as a as, sorry, first worked as a genetic counselor and then went on to complete his PhD in our school, studying the then very new genomic technology comparative genomic hybridization under Dr. Hirshhorn. After next completing a fellowship in clinical cytogenetics, uh, Bryn joined our faculty working in cytogenetics for four years. In 2005, he moved to Columbia where he rose through the ranks to his current one of professor of pathology and cell biology. He is the medical director of the Clinical Cytogenetics Lab, as well as co-director of the Laboratory of Personalized Genomic Medicine. Bryn has been a leader in the transition of his field from classical cytogenetics, performing a karyotype to look for chromosomal abnormalities, something Dr. Hirschhorn helped develop 60 plus years ago, into molecular cytogenetics, far more powerful and more finely resolved. 
He has played roles in implementing uh, techniques such as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and non-invasive prenatal testing. Bryn has participated in key NIH-funded trials testing those approaches and has an extensive corpus of important peer-reviewed papers describing the work. He is on the board of directors for two major genetics-related biomedical organizations. Taken as a whole, Bryn is an outstanding genomic scientist. As I have known Bryn since his earliest days as a student at Mount Sinai, it has been a true pleasure to see his career bloom in this magnificent way. He is also one of the kindest people whom I know, so it also feels well-deserved. Bryn, we all look forward to hearing your remarks. I think I'm trying to get some slides up. Bruce, there you are. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's really uh, a huge honor and pleasure for me to be here at Mount Sinai. Uh, it's a place that represents not only my entry into the workforce, but also my entry into a new country and the start of a whole new way of life. And as Bruce told you, I came to the USA in 1990. I arrived with two suitcases, a guitar, but most importantly, I came with an education. Actually, the guitar was also pretty important because it was my backup plan should my career in genetics not go too well. I was South Africa's first trained genetic counselor, but at that time, there were simply no jobs as genetic counseling was a new concept in South Africa. Growing up in South Africa, I never imagined that I would land up in New York, a place that actually seemed pretty scary to me at that time. But 33 years later, I look back and recognize the incredible journey that I've been on. The title of my talk indicates a voyage from Africa to New York, but my journey and experiences have encompassed so much more. And today I would like to share with you some of the things that I experienced and learned along the way. While you never know exactly where life will take you, I do believe that you have the power to influence the well being of the ride and the overall experience. So, the first piece of advice I have for you is be an active participant in your profession and get involved. I can tell you that my career took on a different meaning the moment I embraced this philosophy. Starting off at Mount Sinai, I was volunteered, but ultimately agreed to be on the Institutional Review Board, which is tasked with reviewing research proposals to ensure the safety privacy, rights, and overall well-being of patients and study subjects. I did this during my PhD, which means that you don't have to wait until you graduate to get involved in activities important to your profession. Now, those that involvement can be as part of your class activities, as part of the biologic, you know, part of the school, as part of the, anything that happens at the hospital. And very often there are certain events where the hospital engages with the community surrounding. And so I really encourage you, you know, to take those, the opportunity while you are studying to start your involvement. And certainly as you begin to entrench yourself in your profession, try to be more than just a sideline observer. Invariably during your studies, you will go to conferences, national conferences, where you will look at research, uh, you know, uh, presentations from other colleagues of yours, you'll present your research, take the opportunity at those meetings to meet your peers, get involved in discussion groups. It's a time, an incredible time for you really, really to start building up your network. Now, the practice of medicine is often guided by standards set by committees and task members, uh, uh, task member members who strive to collate evidence-based research and turn it into practice guidelines. Now, that research is something that you're intimately involved in. Why not be one of those committee or task force members? I certainly remember discussing with colleagues how a certain practice guideline omitted one thing 
and should have elaborated on another. It's certainly easy to have contrary opinions and complain, but unless you do something about it, all you have is a frustrating ongoing complaint. Your actions can be as simple as responding even um, written in a, in, in a written manner uh, to a call for comments, which sometimes your, uh, your national committees ask for. And so you can respond in that way. The uh, conferences that you attend, it's very easy. You show up, you present, you, 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 you watch other presentations, but a lot goes into organizing those conferences. And very often they call for volunteers to be part of the organizing committees, et cetera. So this really is a time for you to start getting involved. My impetus for getting involved stemmed in part from the research that I was involved in, which as Bruce told you, often revolved around development of new diagnostic technologies. And having invested a great deal of my time on the precise subject matter that would ultimately be utilized in clinical practice, I felt that rather be told the hows, whys, and whens of when to use the new technology, I could actually have key input into shaping those hows, whys, and whens. Engaging with your colleagues and your community allows you to have dynamic updates on important aspects of your field, which ultimately will benefit your research and for those involved in translational medicine, your patients or patients. Your engagement can be at the local, national, or even international level. And for those of you who choose to work outside of academic medicine, get to know your local communities and build a network of colleagues who's practice, who do practice at hospitals or academic centers. This type of engagement builds valuable and enduring resources that remain extremely useful as you go through your career. Now, I've been involved in some fascinating research, investigating and diagnosing, diagnosing genetic disease from embryo to adult, and I've seen some amazing things. So I want to just kind of show you just one or two of these things very briefly, because some of you may never be able to see them. And hopefully, let's see if this goes. And there we go. So what you're looking at now is actually a human embryo. And what you see is someone doing a biopsy of a single cell from an embryo. I have to tell you the first time I saw this, this just blew me away. Now, our ability to take that single cell and do genetic diagnosis on that embryo is it was quite amazing. And that was one of the things that piqued my interest in being involved in IVF diagnostics and pre-implantation genetic testing. More recently, we have the ability to take DNA strands, put them through nanochannels and image them so that as they go through those channels, you'll be able to see individual DNA strands. And there you see them eventually in a single level. And that's kind of what they look like. They have certain barcodes on them. And we can take that and we can match them up. We can see what's missing, what's extra, what's rearranged, and understand how those changes actually impact disease and, in a lot of cases, cancer. And this is an active part of um, research that I'm involved in. Let's see, hopefully get to the next one. There we go. I've seen incredible changes. We used to have large cabinet size sequences, and then we were able to take those sequences and put them onto a desktop. And now we have sequences that can fit, as you can see, in the palm of your hand. We can take DNA and we can sequence them through these beautiful nanopores at sequencing about 27,000 nucleotides per minute. And this is quite incredible. Uh, prenatal diagnosis used to be done in an invasive manner, or it still is done, but we used to stick a needle through the abdomen or the, or the cervix and get some of the fetal material and do prenatal testing and look for genetic disease. Now we can take blood from mom. We can get a simple blood test from her, which does contain fetal DNA, and we can do the same types of analyses simply by looking at mom's blood and find out, does the baby have certain genetic diseases? And the same type of principle we can apply now to cancer, because we do have cancer cells floating around in our serum, and this has led to a whole exciting new avenue called liquid biopsies, where instead of doing a lung biopsy, which is very invasive, we do have the potential just to do a blood test and make diagnoses and track uh, certain cancers. And this, I think, is gonna be a very 
important part of our health uh, screening as we go forward. So these exciting advancements in medicine have been incredibly inspiring and have been fueled my ongoing passion for what I do. Dr. Nessa spoke about that passion, and it is so, so important. And that's the second important thing that I learned. It really is important to enjoy what you do. It gives you the drive and energy to tackle each day with enthusiasm and, dare I say, excitement. When you have that energy and drive, you're more inclined to invest in your career, which links back to my first point of being an active participant in your field. With that energy, you have the power to take charge of your career trajectory. But remember, you do need to enjoy life as well. So striking a healthy balance between your work life and everything outside of work is just as important. Now, when you do cool things, it's no surprise that people want to hear about it. And that's not only in the USA. And I never thought that being in academic medicine that I would actually travel the world so much. I can tell you my dad was a travel agent, and I think that I had traveled more than he ever traveled during his whole lifetime. So the lesson here is do cool things and you'll travel to cool places. So let me show you. I've looked down through the glass floor of Tokyo Tower. I've gone to the top of the world's tallest building in Dubai. I've traversed the Great Wall of China and stood at the foot of the Pyramid of Chichen Itza. I've ridden camels in the desert in the Middle East, patted cheetahs in Africa, fed kangaroos in Australia. And you may find yourselves in the castle walls of Ankara in Turkey or at Montserrat Sanctuary in the mountaintops of Bogota, Colombia. Maybe you'll take in the sunshine at the foot of the Marshall Zukov Monument outside Red Square or um, be below Mozart's statue in Vienna or simply gaze upon a gorgeous sunset in Hyderabad, India. Along the way, you'll encounter different languages and you'll see and use colorful new currencies. But more importantly, you'll interact with people from all different walks of life. And along the way, you'll make incredible new connections. You'll establish new networks, enjoy the friendships of colleagues around the world, and hopefully have a little fun in the way. And this is just some of the many people that I've met. These things have led to new collaborations, different networks, et cetera. And we do have fun along the way. Um, one of the most uh, the last thing I'll add to that is you actually may never know what surprising and maybe terrif terrifying person you may stumble upon <laughs> at your next conference. And yep, he was right in front of me, probably. <laughs> so my last piece of advice is treat every day as a learning experience. Identify great mentors and embrace them as great mentors teach you more than just medicine and science. And as Bruce said, I was fortunate to have two amazing mentors. He spoke about Kurt Hirschhorn on the right and Dorothy Warburton on the left. Kurt led by example and over and above his phenomenal accomplishments and knowledge. He taught me how to have confidence in myself. He never micromanaged me and instead he gave me autonomy and set an environment where I wanted to work hard and do well, thereby reinforcing his faith in me. He had the same level of respect whether you were a high school student or the chancellor of a university. He taught me the meaning of paying it forward, possessing the insight of how important it is to invest in the next generation. And certainly as you go through your careers, I really hope that you will have that same insight and pay, pay it forward. Dorothy on the left, an icon in the field of cytogenetics, recruited me to Columbia in 2005 to take, her, take over from her as the medical director of the clinical cytogenetics lab. Dorothy, Dorothy didn't retire, but merely stepped down as the director. She actively continued a prolific as a prolific researcher and still reviewed clinical cases. And I was quite in awe of working in the same place as Dorothy and actually felt a little intimidated working in her shadow. And technically, I was her boss. Her leadership really came in the way she worked alongside me, skillfully driving other faculty and staff my way as they naturally ambulated to her for decisions regarding lab operations and for so many other things. And one of my proudest and confidence building moments was when she came into my office seeking my input on clinical cases that she was reviewing. In fact, she did this on multiple occasions. In doing so, Dorothy taught me an invaluable lesson. 
A key part of treating every day as a learning experience is knowing your limitations. Never shy away from reaching out to a colleague when you are unsure or don't know something, or in Dorothy's case, looking for a different viewpoint or just confirmation of an answer she wasn't 100% sure of. This is where that network of colleagues becomes so important. It's too often in life where failure to recognize our own limitations can lead to undesirable outcomes. It takes courage to acknowledge when you are stuck and need help. And for those of you who watched the TV series, Ted Lasso, okay, you were hopefully inspired by Ted's humility and readiness to seek help. For those of you who never saw Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso is about an American football coach who is asked to go to England to coach an English football, aka soccer team. At his first press conference, Ted says, you can fill two internets with what I don't know about football. And so he demonstrates great trust and confidence in his colleagues and team, and his ability to accept help is a key tenet of his success. So as you all embark on the exciting new pathway that you've chosen for yourselves, I hope you invest in yourselves, get involved in your field, and engage with your community and colleagues. Be curious and treat every day as a lesson in medicine, science, as well as life. Know your limitations and see those around you as a resource to continuously improve who you are and what you do. In doing so, I trust that every day will be fulfilling and you will no doubt um, make an indelible impact by your research on many patients and society as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Levy. I hope your words today serve as uh, an inspiration to our students and help guide them as they embark on their uh, academic research journey. The next part of this ceremony, the part many of you have been awaiting, will be the presentation of the 2023 matriculating PhD students and third year MD PhD students with lab coats as a symbolic induction into their rigorous academic scientific training. The students will receive their lab coats from distinguished members of the graduate school faculty who exemplify outstanding graduate teaching and mentoring. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, some of our distinguished directors of our multidisciplinary training areas who will be alternating in coding the 2023 matriculating PhD class and the third year MD PhD students. Please stand as I call your names. Dr. George Huntley, director of our neuroscience program. Dr. Alan Seifert, co-director of the Artificial Intelligence and Emerging Technology Medicine, MTA. <laughs> Dr. Doris Germain, co-director of the Cancer Biology, MTA. Dr. Florence Marlowe, co-director of the Development Regeneration Stem Cell Biology, MTA. <laughs> Drs. Ann Bocock and Sander Houghton, co-directors of the Genetics and Genomic Sciences, MTA. <laughs> Drs. Jeremiah Faith and Constantine Alexandropoulos, co-directors of the Immunology, MTA. <laughs> Doctors. Domenico Tortorella and Jim Lin, co-directors of Microbiology MTA. And last but not least, Dr. Michael Lazarus, director of the Disease Mechanism and Therapeutics MTA. It is also my pleasure to introduce this year's roster reader for our doctoral students, Dr. Bessel Hans, Senior Associate Dean for Postdoctoral and Student Affairs, Associate Dean of, of Wellness in the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences and Associate Professor of Medicine, Dr. Hans. Uh, thank you very much, Marta. Um, allow me please to add my welcome to our new PhD students and our MD PhD students who are starting their research training. Um, it is a real thrill for me to be here uh, and an honor for me to be reading all of your names as you come up on stage. Um, 
We'll be calling up students for everybody in the audience. We'll be calling up the students in groups of three or four. Um, so what I'd ask you to do is to hold your hoots and hollers and applause until they all four have come up and received their coats, and then you can make as much noise as you'd like to make. Um, with that, as they're getting ready, um, I would like to also invite Drs. Huntley, Seifert, Germain, and Marlow up on stage. They're our first group of, of coders. Change our slide, so give me one second. All right. All right, so it is, it is my pleasure, as I said, to call up our, our students um, to receive their coats. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Liba Opsel, Elizabeth Alcantara, Emma Andreka, and Nikki Brisnovola. You guys can come off this by now. All right, next we have Eleanor Burgess, Ariella Buxbaum Grace, Lillian Chang, and Shenja Chen. Nicholas Church, Sarah Claypool, Susanna Jayameda, Nishta Desai. Cho Zuan, Diego Espinoza, Gabriela Frickless, Luis Miguel Garcia Pena. Come this way, it's a little safer. Matteo Jonaselli, Adelina Grushka, Jolie Huang, Aubrey Hauser. Charlotte Kearns, Grace Kim, Jean Kim, Eli Kritzer. Ayako Kuno, Andrew Curlin, Henesis Lara Grandos, and Dariel Lewis Sanders.
Yvonne Lin, Ella Lubbers, Manish Manaharan, Anaga Menon. Right at this point, I'm going to say thank you to our current coders and call up the next batch. I'd like to have Dr. Bocock, Houghton, Faith, and Alex Andropoulos come up, please. Trung Nguyen, Isabel Payne, Jiang Pham, Aditi Prasad. Ashley Richardson, Allison Salinas, Nazifa Salsabil, Arushi Samal. Sanuta Shetty, Justice Simonetti, Bavia Singh, Corinne Smith. Conrad Schneoff, Keaton Song, Jennifer Strong, Howe Sun. Caroline Tavalachi, Chan Do, Gilana Testavaya, Brian Tricochi. Adelaida Turco, Stefania Valencia, Jared Wheeler, Sandia Yadev. Vivek Yadev, Vivian Yan, Mimi Zhang, and Nancy Zhang. So congratulations to all of our incoming and uh, MD, I'm sorry, incoming PhD students. Um, congratulations. Thanks to the MTA directors too. <laughs> so it is now time to call on stage the medical scientist training program. Students who will also be starting their research, Dr. Talia Schwartz, 
Senior Associate Dean for uh, MD PhD Education with the names of the MD candidate, MD PhD candidates, Dr. Swartz. Please come on stage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Filazola. And I'd like to ask our next uh, bunch of coders to come up, Dr. Tortorella, Dr. Lim, Dr. Schlesinger, and Dr. Lazarus. Okay, wonderful. So it is my pleasure to call up the MD-PhD students who will be beginning their PhD journey. And we ask for you to uh, reserve your applause until all three of the candidates have been invited up. Um, Rachel Geltman, Elizabeth Kahn, Erica Nemeth. Casho Rilope Ogantuyo, Tracy Okin, Ezekiel Olu Muyade. Braxton Schultz. Sophia Sue, Stephanie Song. We have three coders for Kevin Spehar. Congratulations to the MD-PhD students starting their PhD. It's a great pleasure to present again Dr. Basil Hans to uh, administer the PhD oath, followed by the faculty pledge. Thank you again, Marta. Um, I'd like to first call on all of the students uh, today who were coded um, to take a moment, uh, stand up, uh, turn either to the audience or to the cameras um, and just give a very loud thank you to all of those who have helped you get to this point uh, in your career. Hey. All right. So congratulations to all of you who've received your coat. Uh, I now ask you all to, I'm sorry, stand up again. <laughs> uh, as we recite uh, the PhD oath, um, before I begin reading the oath, I would also like to invite all of the PhD doctoral students uh, uh, and candidates in the audience, the PhDs in the audience and those seated next to me to also stand so that we can affirm or rededicate ourselves. Um, to this oath. Uh, the oath is displayed here, but it's also found on page eight of the printed booklet. All right, so with my doctor of philosophy, I willingly pledge to uphold the highest level of integrity, professionalism, scholarship, and honor. I will conduct my research and professional endeavors with honesty and objectivity. I will apply the highest standards of rigor and respect for the generation and application of knowledge and fully acknowledge the contributions of others. I will not allow financial gain or ambition to cloud my judgment or decision-making nor cause harm to society or subjects of research. 
I will embark on the furthering of knowledge through respectful interactions and collaborations with my colleagues and community. I will be a role model and use my skills of an entire mentor and empower future generations, instilling in them the highest principles of ethical behavior. As witnessed by all present today and in the tradition of graduates before me, I do affirm to uphold these guiding principles. Seated now. I now ask all of our faculty members of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai to stand and join me in the faculty pledge, uh, which is printed on page nine and can be found also on the screen. As teachers and mentors for our students, we pledge to maintain the highest professional standards in all of our interactions with students, patients, colleagues, and staff. We pledge our utmost effort to ensure that all components of the educational program for students will be of the highest quality. We will respect all students as individuals without regard to gender, race, national origin, religion, or sexual orientation. We will not tolerate anyone who manifests disrespect or express biased attitudes towards any student. We will not tolerate any abuse or exploitation of students. In an effort to nurture personal development, we pledge that students will have adequate time for reflection as well as personal and family obligations. In nurturing both the intellectual and professional development of our students, we will celebrate achievement of academic excellence and demonstration of the highest virtues of our profession. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the staff of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences for planning this ceremony. Special recognition goes to the following individuals who have meticulously planned the, this event. Kathy Dilx. Kathy, you should stand up. Sahara, <laughs> Sarah Bryant, Jerry Draftery, and Matt Cipriano. Without their diligence, and dedication, the ceremony would not have been possible. Additionally, I would like to thank the Mount Sinai Alumni Association for their steadfast support. All attendees are cordially invited to attend the reception here at the ICANN building down the stairs to the lower level. Please remain seated until uh, those on stage have exited the auditorium. Students, if you are a member of the entering 2023 uh, classes, please remain seated for a group of photos. This concludes the 2023 lab code ceremony of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Thank you and congratulations to all. <laughs>